Welcome on back to this episode of the Country and Coal Cans podcast. I'm Logan. I'm Andrew. Well, college football is finally back. Uh, as you might can tell, I don't know if you can yet, you will be eventually. My voice is not all there right now. It's pretty obvious. <clears throat> NC State football is back. It's my favorite time of the year. To me, it's better than Christmas. And I spent all of yesterday out in the hot sun yelling at East Carolina University visiting fans because the Pirates suck, and we gave them a shellacking in the vein of 34-6. to Andy was also Like there. last year. Just like, well, not quite as bad as last year. Last year was 58-3. to Still bad. Still bad, but whooped up on them. I'm just excited for college football to be back. I'm glad it wasn't too hot either. Uh, it it really wasn't that bad compared to... It wasn't that to, bad compared to past years. To you're, past right. Years. you're right. <clears throat> but it still still was kind of warm. It'd still be nice for it not to be at noon. Yeah, totally. But like, if there's one thing that's true about the North Carolina State Wolfpack, that's we're always good enough to be on TV, but never good enough for prime time. So <laughs> we get stuck with a lot of noon games. And noon games and... North Carolina during August and September are horrible because it's always very humid, very hot, and just you're just out there baking in the sun for hours. But you know what? That's the sacrifice we make to watch our mediocre sports programs. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like I said, college football is back. And I'm excited. You know, ACC football is back because I'm definitely here in ACC country. Uh I, Duke didn't do, do so great. Duke didn't do, do so great, but they were playing Alabama, so what do we expect? Nobody cares about UNC. Yeah, nobody cares about UNC. UNC sucks. They they did beat South Carolina, and all I've been hearing is, Mac is back. Mac, nobody cares. Mac Brown, nobody gives a shit. But anyways, go Pack. And I guess today... Go to hell, Carolina. Yeah, go to hell, Carolina, as always. <clears throat> but I, anyways, today we're uh, going to try to do... a a, a record roundup here of Dalton a Domino's a review of Dalton Domino's new record songs from the exile and uh I it came out what, two weeks ago two weeks ago yeah we wanted to like get this out pretty quick because but at the same time we had scheduling conflicts last weekend where we couldn't make it work so we were gonna knock this out on Labor Day weekend here um after NC State took care of business against the Pirates and Bable so you know but, here we are. Let's uh, dive into the record. Because um, we heard some of the stuff off this record back in true. February when he opened up for, for Wade, Wade Bowen. Bowen. And it was his first show back um, after his stint in rehab. Day, day 26. He, it was day, yeah, I think it was day 26. It was day 26. Because I, I think it was, it, he brought that point up when he was singing Corners um, at that show. Because like he, I think he had written that song, was it 26 days after the first time he had to do a little bit of rehabilitation? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, he wrote that 26 days after the first yeah. time, <clears throat> and then he played in Raleigh on the second 26th day. Yeah, yeah, and um, so this record was different in that it was recorded and uh, written and recorded before he went to rehab. I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of times when you have personal songs like this, it typically with a lot of artists is after they they do that. But he actually wrote and recorded all of this, to my knowledge. Um, before he had admitted himself into rehab, and this was a different. This is really you ca- where we kind of see Dalton Domino, like catching his uh, uh, going, catching his like songwriting st- stride. Uh, stride, yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Sorry, I can't talk or think today. But uh, but he's really hitting his stride. That's the phrase I'm looking for. He's hitting his stride. We're going to be in trouble if you're going to uh, rely on me for vocabulary words. <laughs> Fair enough. But it, he's really hitting his stride and, you know, as a songwriter. His t- first two records had some moments where he was like wrote phenomenal songs that are very personal. But overall, it wasn't the same level of quality of songwriting that you find on this third record. This is by far his best record, in my opinion. At times, the other ones, I think, would leave you lacking a little bit. Yeah. I still think it, I think his best songs are on... The, the top out of all of them are on the... Uh, I think Corners is probably better than anything that's been on that was album. That was on a second record, Yeah, I and then cer- certain ones, but as a whole, it's the whole, as a whole a- album is, is yeah, best. This yeah. is definitely the best overall. album as a whole. Because uh, Dalton Domino really finds himself in a weird spot, um, I guess, within the Texas scene, because he really is a songwriter, songwriter at heart. I mean, he comes from the, the Lubbock scene, where uh, the, blue, the blue light, where there's a lot of, like... Uh, like bevy of great songwriters that have come through that that area, 
And that's what he really is. He wants to have the respect of like his songwriting peers and everything, obviously. I mean, he, especially when you're a talented songwriter like he is. But at the same time, he plays predominantly in the Texas scene to where there's this expected kind of like, I guess, sound, sound so to speak, where you have to mix the, the soft kind of um, really deep songwriting moments with some in-your-face guitars in some ways to, to have an energetic live show. Because, I mean, that's what concerts are partially about is, you know, going to having a good time and you want some energy there. Unless you're going to a sit-down so, show. Yeah, or unless you're going to a listening room or something. But in his previous records, Dalton definitely... Um, had the loud. Had, to, had a times. little bit more of the louder. He, he tried to focus on that part of the, the having some energy in his shows and totally understandable. This one, you kind of see him throwing a little bit more caution to the wind of just... Writing what he wants to write, and you know, just let the cards like be as they fall. At times, too, this whole album to me seemed a little bit more. I guess the word would be melodic. Yeah, than the other yeah. two. He really. It, it all kind this of was more, more. It was more evenly. melodic and more poetic than a lot of it. Like, like I said, there were moments on previous ones because Corners yeah. is a phenomenal song. Yeah, the, it's super personal. It, the rain is not yeah. real quiet. But like, but when it comes to songs from the Exile, his third record here, it. This is definitely uh, where he's. It's so personal. It feels like it like, fits too for, for what he's been like for the year he's had. Yeah, well, that's what Personally. I'm saying. Like this yeah. is like honestly, if half of these things are true that he's writing about, like there might be some like he's kind of embellishments. embellishments. I mean, that happens with any songs. But if the, <laughs> if half of what this stuff is true, man, he's been through some shit. And like you got to give that guy credit That's for making it out said, the like, other when, end. Even when he started playing earlier this year, when he told yeah. the, like the stories of all, he was that nervous stuff. that yeah. that show that we saw him play. Yeah, because yeah. he played he played acoustically too. Yeah, he played he by did. himself. He did, but he like this is just a sad record. But I mean, that's not a bad thing. I like it. Like, but this is a sad record. He um he definitely has been through some stuff this year, and you kind of can see that on a lot of their songs. I mean. What are some of the songs you kind of thought were highlights? I got the highlights. Just uh, we can talk about them a little bit on all through all this, but I got this probably not in order. But the nerve, all I need, hush puppy, half blood, daddy's mud, and welcome home. Well, did you exclude any? Because it sounded like you named the whole record. (laughs) It's it's, it's one song over half. (laughs) One over half. Fair enough. Hey, we said it was good. I didn't say it was all garbage. (laughs) Right. I mean, obviously, when it's good, you're gonna have a bunch. I guess, yeah, but I mean, I said highlights. I didn't say tell me about the whole record. But yeah, I, well, those all highlights. Well, that what? I mean, don't just give me a list. Oh, we I'm die. asking for some analysis here. <laughs> I think uh, what was the lead single? All I need was the first. It was the first one, I believe. Yeah, and that, that was one of the few that wasn't like really sad. Yeah, so to speak. There's a couple of songs. Really. Yeah, it's a yeah. love song. It just sounds so good. Yeah, it's and with uh, what's I? We're gonna probably butcher her name because I really don't know how to say this. But Kelsey Kulik, maybe I guess I that's know. her name. How you say that name? I have no she idea. She sounds very good the way that's put in there and arranged. Yeah. It just sounds very good. It's not. I don't want to say a spectacular songwriting, but it's good for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. a good written song. It just sounds amazing. Well, it was a good song for a lead single too to kind of like prepare people for their record because, like you said, it wasn't overly sad. It had a good. It was like a good mid tempo song that had a good groove and a pleasing melody. So like. And that, and like Kelsey, or however you pronounce her name, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, she is a phenomenal vocalist, and she brought some uh, a lot of life and energy to that particular track. But that was probably one of maybe, what, three, four songs at the most that weren't really just sad, bummer yeah. games of a song. Well, some of them, I, I say a fair amount of the sad songs on here, too, aren't the, they're sad songs played, not I'm going to say loud, but... Well, no, there ain't really anything loud on this record. Yeah, but it's, it's not, it's not a full-on... You know, I don't know, man. It's Tennessee. It's pretty, it's pretty American sad. Aquarium. It's, sad sound. I kind of have to disagree with you there. It, there are some redeeming songs, yes, if that's what you're getting at. But I don't think that this is really just like an upbeat sad song. I think there's no, a, no, no. there's a lot of sad shit. I say, but here. like to me, like uh, I go to your next song I had on here too. His next single too is Daddy's Mud. Yeah, it's yeah. not like it's a super bummer jam. It's a sad song. I, mean, I think it is. It's a standard set. I don't think it's a total bummer jam. I don't know what's happy about that song. It's not if you happy. You can tell me what's happy about I'm that song. Feel free. It, but. It, the sound wise is just a little bit more upbeat than I, that's a not bummer upbeat. jam to me. I, well, we're gonna have to agree to disagree yeah. on that because I don't see anything upbeat. Well, hey, that song. he does say in that song that he does say in the song though, it, what all he has might not be much, but it's good enough for him. Yeah. Even though, or I can't say I totally uh, understand that because 
everything he listened to that song, the characteristics he got from his dad, all yeah. sound pretty bad. <laughs> well, I will say one of the ones that, while we're on the topic of like some of the more upbeat ones, I think Love is Dangerous will be a good concert song. Like it definitely doesn't have the energy of some of his previous previous songs on other records, but it's definitely one that's gonna. I think it'll play well to the crowd, and that like wasn't quite one of those just like sad bastard of a songs, but uh, one of my favorite songs on the record. I think is the best song on the record. I know you and I disagree on this, but I think the best song on the record is Hush Poppy. It's a fantastic song. It, it does remind you a little bit of. Uh, Andy brought this up, and he was right about this. It brought, it reminds you a little bit of Wade Bowen's Death, Dying, and Deviled Eggs. I think it reminds me too much of that. Maybe. And I didn't love that song either. But see, I think this is a better version of Death, Dying, and Deviled Eggs, no. to be fair. I, to me, I just, and, but like, like the reason I think Hush Puppy is the best, in my opinion, I'll just say this, and then Andy can talk about what his best one, I guess, it was. But Hush Puppy, I think, was the best just because it was a very different way of, of telling a story about how you're, when you lose someone, that whether it's a parent, a grandparent, a loved one, a friend, whatever whoever, whatever the relationship there is, it's a very different way of telling that. It's, it tells an extremely sad story in explicit detail, but with a little bit of a lighter tone that it's not just like, like talking about everything just being completely like you're in tears and everything like at a funeral. He explains the funeral and goes into detail talking about how, you know, um, when they're the like his sister, you know, is just sitting there staring and his cousin sings a song and like explaining what the people are doing there. But then, like, after the funeral, the family all gathers and his sister kind of takes a lighter tone. She was like, It's just like that son of a bitch who took the hush puppy recipe with him. That like, line really stood that, out. Yeah, me. that's a that was the best line in the song, in my opinion. And uh, because, like I said, it it was able to tell you that, that, take that sad story, but kind of have a little bit of a lighter feel to it. But also, like like I said, the imagery in the song I thought was very, very good. Like, for instance, at the beginning of the chorus, when they're, like, saying, um, we're no longer going to be smelling the smoke and coffee in the kitchen at 5 a.m., and then the next line it gives into how his mom's going to react. She may not want to admit it, but she's going to miss it. Kind of like just saying how that that presence of that person that was in your life is now there's going to be a hole there. And that leads into the end of the chorus that I think is just a phenomenal uh, line where it says, they tell you, and it's just such a true, true to life line here. They tell you the day will come, but they don't tell you how to f- fill the space when something good is gone. Like, and it's so true. If you've ever lost someone, you, you know that, you know that day is going to show up one day where they're not going to be there, but you never know actually how to react and to deal with it until you've been put through it personally. And people can't, and you, it's, it's inexplicable. People can't really tell you how to deal with it. It's just something you have to do on your own. And that's why I think Hush Puppy struck a chord with me is I think that it was, it hits on such a personal level that it's, but at the same time, it's also a, a, a very universal theme that really can is relatable for anyone that has ever gone through it and i think that's just like why i, I thought that was a, it was a very deep song with what a very and very had very good um imagery throughout i said for the same reason too. my favorite song of that one was half blood which i'm a little biased to because i do think i i want to say the first time he played that live was when he played in raleigh right i know he played it and it, that song really stood out to me even then the first time i heard it but that's even in just the first verse of that song, he tells the story of, you know, his mom left because dad got drunk and hit her. Then he goes to tell, you know, at the same time, tells the story of how... He was on the four-day bender. How he went on the four-day bender <laughs> yeah. in Tunica, you know, paints the story of two people already there. Right. You know, and then she left, and it tells the story about even before she left town, about how she... Uh, she moved to like the other side of town. She came mm-hmm. back. Like, he took his sister. I think it's his sister. It could be a... a Bro- a brother, but I think I want to say it was. I want to say it was his half sister, but the only reason I, think I, I want to say that too, but I, I don't I think if I remember correctly, I think that's what he said when we saw him in concert. I think I so think too, that's why. It's but I don't know head. if in my head I'm just assuming it was right. His sister. What was it that thing we watched at the Mandela? Yeah, we just filling. I, I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if I'm just assuming that. But then you know, it tells the story of how like his mom came back, took his sister, went mm-hmm. to another town, and all that. It tells so many. Like it tells like the story of like. The dad, the mom, you know, even brings in a, mm-hmm. a future. Uh, I guess it would be a stepdad. Yeah. Or he yeah, did talk about when the, yeah. some guy. It, gave it tells her a the ring. story yeah. of like four people, like characters, simultaneously. Simultaneously, and it doesn't. It's not just a mention to them. It, right. it gives you a somewhat in depth. You know, because a lot of times in songwriting, you'll have it where 
you know, it would have just left it at dad got drunk and hit mom and she left. But it yeah. tells the story of what, what he was yeah. doing when he got drunk. It tells it through the lens of his relationship with yeah. his sibling. And then I, it, but it, what, like you're saying, but at the same time, like the, it's telling like yeah. a bunch, like the behind the story, like it's so many stories packed into one song and it's all just good storytelling. But and then it tells the story of the whole family as a whole. Right. And then, you know, then, you know, him and his his sister gets, I guess, kicked out for not, you know, behaving or causing well, trouble. Whatever or, the, even if she really yeah, was, it said you know, they kicked her. Out. She got kicked, kicked, kicked out at seventeen, 17 because she must have got on the new stepfather. Yeah, and then he got to, back. You yeah. know, him and his sister ended up. I, I took it as kind of you know uh, maybe living with other family. Right. Is right. how. It, but it just tells such a well story. Saying they had the same blood pumping through their. Yeah, hearts. That's what I would yeah. think. Like you know, grandparents, uncles, yeah. something, something like that, or even maybe just people that just. Maybe it's just people that actually them. loved them. Yeah. I mean, maybe not necessarily actual blood relatives, but maybe just people that actually cared for them and took care it's of them. It's just a good story for the whole song, and yeah. then it has like four shorter stories within the song, and it's just right. not something you hear oh, that it's, often. It's a fantastic song. I remember when we heard, heard it live. I wasn't, it really, I wasn't impressed with it live, but I, I, feel like I, I think I just wasn't really listening to it. Andy loved it from the very yeah, beginning. I and think that might be a little biased to that. Yeah. I, well, to I be fair, this, like after I heard the studio version, I was on board with you thinking it was a phenomenal I song. I want to say that was the first time he played it. I want to yeah. say he said that, but I could just not be. That was I several came, months ago. I came around on it after hearing the studio version. Like I, I came around to your opinion on that. But I think I, think I just fantastic. didn't listen good enough when we were at the I show. think before I'd even heard the whole album, I'd already made my mind up. That was yeah. my favorite song. <laughs> right. But still pretty much stands true yeah. on that. I really, really like Dead Roses. And the reason I like Dead Roses, because so the sound of this record, it Andy and I were talking about yesterday, this is probably his most sonically consistent, I yeah. think was the term we used, um, sonically consistent record that he's had. But it, it borrows just as much from rock as it does from country, but it's not like in-your-face loud, right? It's like singer-songwriter rock. So it's like it borrows just as much from rock as it does from country, but the probably one of the countryer moments on the record is one of my favorites, and that was Dead Roses. The steel guitar that is throughout that song is fantastic. I'm a huge fan of pedal steel. It's my favorite instrument. It's There's nothing. There's no instrument that can uh, emote like a human voice like a pedal steel can. And I, I think it's just because the pedal helps, like you know, the pitch raise up and down. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not a uh, pedal steel expert by any means, but I believe that's like what that does. And it just it has that very humanistic whine to it, and it, it just can. It's the perfect like seasoning for a for a song. And I, whenever a song features it and does it well, it's it definitely strikes a chord with me. Um, but Dead Roses, I think, has got some great songwriting on it. Uh, for instance, I love. The part where he's like, you got to break your heart just to know what it needs. Examine the holes just to see how it bleeds. Because it, it's a very true-to-life line. Like, you, you don't really know what you really want in life until you've had some disappointment. As sad as that may be to, <laughs> to say, it's, it's just yeah, probably hey, the true. highs aren't the highs without the lows. Exactly. You got to, what was it our friend Chase says? Uh, you got to you gotta have some lows so you can enjoy the highs. <laughs> <laughs> But something like that. Something like something to that effect. But uh, Dead Roses uh, also like during the chorus it says, "I love this line too." It says, "Dead Roses still have thorns, baby. Sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is just a flame." And I just like how that just presents this thing of sometimes people have this false hope and they think things are going to turn out, but guess what? They don't. Instead, the light at the end of the tunnel is just a flame, and really your house is burning down because your life is is crumbling around you. <laughs> it's, house it's not a burning. Yeah, it's not a uh, it's not a very uplifting and redeeming song in my opinion. But I think that it's very true to life for a lot of times because everything isn't uh, candy and, and lollipops. You know, sometimes real life hits you in the face like a ton of bricks. There's another thing I noticed. That I noticed on two songs, but it could have been noticed. I could be on there more. I just hadn't picked up on it yet. Is it seems to be to an extent that he blames like other people for some of his own flaws on this right. like in daddy's mud it's yeah. obviously he's the one doing all these yeah. things you know he's holding the grudges up. but he says you know i got this from my dad yeah and the other thing i little pick that up a little bit on the uh, on the nerve too where mm. he said you know it says the nerve you had to let me fall in love with you like i said i, I do. do yeah you know it's kind of like you know I, instead well, of just well, what are you doing yeah. here you know instead of deal. just taking responsibility 100% yeah percent for things that you have chosen in your life you're looking to export the blame and i see that else. in daddy's mud and yeah. the nerve and, and I think that's very indicative of now that we now that you mentioned that I just thought about this. I think it's very indicative of where Dalton probably was at yeah. that moment in time. It was before his rehab stand. He was going through some some a lot of crap at the time, and I really think that he was looking for answers and looking.
looking as to why things were the way they were. And it's natural. It's human nature to be like, well, it's not all my fault. And eventually you accept things that are your fault, but it's human yeah. nature to try to blame something on somebody else. And I think he probably was going through something It's like, like in that. that says, right? I mean, it's like perfectly like the nerve you have to let me, you know, saying the nerve yeah, you had yeah. to let me do that. Yeah, you know? exactly. There's another line from that song too that I really like too, and the nerves, because uh, he said 26 is too old for, uh, it's too old for young love and yeah. too young to die from one. Right. I really like that line in that song oh, too. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, it's, like you said, he he's looking for a reason to blame. I, that song is a. I agree with you. That song really struck a nerve. Pun definitely intended. But <laughs> it. Um, it also sounded like Wildflowers, Tom Petty. Yeah, I can see that too. That's you. You kind of compared some of uh, that record to Dalton, sonically speaking. Yeah. Not necessarily to an on extent, a songwriting, yeah. but to an extent, like that part was of it. Like there. a little like the Eagles type country. Yeah. If you add that a little bit into. The, Wildflowers, Tom Petty. I, I wouldn't really, I don't know, I wouldn't really call it Eagles type California country because there isn't enough vocal harmony. That's, that's, a, that's when you, a mix, when you that, mix that, the, the sound of it with that vocally with yeah. the Tom Petty fair thing is what you get, the <clears> mixing <throat> things. I do think there is some similarity between some of his songwriting and a little bit vocally with some Chris Knight, though. Yeah. Like, I think that that that's, was something that brought to mind for me. Daddy's Mud really reminded me of. Uh, it ain't easy being me by Chris Knight. Yeah, and, I don't know if it's the match the, part about where yeah. you know, Chris Knight moves oh, yeah. down a bridge. Like, yeah. You know, I, I don't know if it's that, but like in general, it, it does remind me of that yeah. quite a bit. And I've, you and I talked about too uh, the guitar work in Daddy's Mud during the musical interlude towards the the second third of the song or where, uh, the third verse after the I third believe. verse maybe it's something like verse. that. It sounds very reminiscent of recent Eric Church songs because Eric Church is definitely more of a rock artist being portrayed in the country genre but he uh it the the guitar tones were very similar to what gets used by eric, eric church and his and his producer jay joyce on a lot of his more recent records and that was a uh, sonically came to mind on a couple of the songs too yeah and another song too that you touched on too about where the point you made with their nerve and the mm-hmm. blame on that is that welcome home i think kind of really mm-hmm. sums up that too in the whole almost to an album extent you know, where he's coming back and it's been he's been gone and stuff and it says you know he's there i heard you lost what you were looking uh where you what you were working towards and found what you've been running from all these years right you know where i guess you know generally when a musician says that it's about going out and playing shows and yeah. stuff but you know but really what he was doing is he's just like you know running from problems back at home things yeah. he's done and then that's how he you know doing that and then too, I like it too in that song too about where you know he comes back and it's the girl is still in town. She she still lives around here, but she doesn't ask about you these days. Yeah. And then later on, I assumed that it was somewhat about the bad things that he'd done in town or whatever. But it says some parts around here might have faded, but there's some stuff time ain't gonna change. Mm-hmm. And I took that to be as some of the the trouble that he had caused in that town. Right. That would have made the. Uh, that that's what's not going to change. And then right. that's why she doesn't, you know, ask about him anymore is because, you know, time's not going to change. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be forgiven for that. You know, even though you came back, you know, not going to change it. Yeah. And I guess one thing that I would say would be like one of my, and this isn't really, I would say, a criticism because he really made up for it. Throughout the whole record, and some of the times, like the, oh, well, I can't really call this a criticism because I think this is more to his credit than anything. A lot of the songs didn't necessarily rhyme in the traditional songwriting sense that people think, but he didn't have to because he told such viv- such a uh, in depth narrative with such vivid imagery that even if the um, it didn't necessarily rhyme in such a like I guess sing songy way for people to really remember, the storytelling made up for it. And I don't think storytelling needs a rhyme. It, that's what I'm. That's my. I'm, that you're, yeah, you just made my point a lot quicker <laughs> I than what I was getting your to. Words. Yeah, but like, uh, but we got to fill time. It is a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like exactly. Like it, it's a great narrative and a great story. So it was like he didn't have to have it rhyme. It wasn't like you know he's sitting out on the tailgate feeling great. Like no, like. But at the same, at the same thing like you're saying too. Like or all I need's not much of a yeah. storytelling. It's very melodic though. Yeah, exactly. He, he picks it up where he it needs up, to be. Exactly. Like the melody and everything on that carried that song in a lot of ways where when the story necessarily wasn't there so he 
he I guess he did pick and choose his moments on that, and that's I think that's to his credit as him taking that next step as a songwriter. You can I think this is really the record we're going to look back and point and say Dalton Domino has arrived as one of the respected songwriters yeah. in Texas. I would have to imagine it's harder like, to tell a story and make every word rhyme at the same time. You're yeah. going to have to give up the ability to yeah. tell the story because the word doesn't rhyme. Right. Yeah. It's just and look that it, things don't always have to be hard rhymes and everything. That's just what people assume when it comes to music. You know, this isn't rap. Yeah. Some of the even then, like they don't always rhyme, but. Like, some of the best songs out there don't rhyme. And people look at me funny when I tell them that, but if you go back and actually take a minute, take a minute, sit back and think about it and listen to those songs, it's accurate. Because, like Andy just said, if you're telling a, a narrative type song and the songwriting is stellar, it doesn't necessarily need to rhyme. I mean, the, the, the story carries the story. I mean, like, if you read like a short story, the, oh, the book doesn't rhyme. Yeah. And I would compare a story type song more to like a short story in a book yeah. versus a sing song. Right. Sing yeah. along nursery rhyme. Like, well, not, well, nursery rhyme's kind of being harsh because chicken fried. We were just having a I was trying conversation to about that. but My vocabulary was running out on me sing song, sing along, nursery, nursery rhyme. rhyme. <laughs> that was all I had. Right. I don't know what you call that. Oh, yeah. They're all songs, so I can't just call it a song. That yeah. doesn't make sense. But yeah, I mean, look, I agree. I think this was. A phenomenal record, uh, start to finish. There weren't a whole lot of like things that I would have to say negative about it. I mean, no. there's it. It's times very few records that I would say I haven't to. got to. There's at times I get a little confused in some storylines right. in it, but I don't know if I just need to read it again but, or see the whole song. Yeah. Like, I try well, to the, find the, the lyrics. record's a grower, you know. Yeah, you I try to find to the uh, the lyrics times. to some of the stuff written out. Mm-hmm. It'd be one of those things where I might need to see written out to piece together the parts of the storyline that I'm getting maybe getting a little. Yeah, jumbled up on, but I couldn't. The lyrics aren't out yet, and I wasn't about to write the whole song down on a piece of paper. Oh yeah, but it might make sense then. But I, cause I don't want to say it doesn't make sense yet because it's not that bad. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, for it's sure. not like uh, that. That where that Riley Green song where uh, <laughs> where you said, "Officer, I, if I, I wouldn't have been speeding if I was sober." <laughs> yeah, I was like, that, was, dude, that just doesn't make old, sense. Yeah, it just doesn't. That sense. just doesn't make sense. I've never. Done you just admit it to Riley drinking Green. and driving. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, obviously, or this doesn't like, make sense. Riley Green was like, uh, excuse me, ma'am, what is your name again? Then what again, what is mine? Yeah. It's, it, I'm just like, all right. It, it, Tom, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it's not obviously doesn't make sense in this. I don't want to say it doesn't make sense yet. Right, yeah, I get it, that. Tom, and it's only a few few lines here and there yeah. that I was like, I don't, I don't know. But I would assume, my other thing I'm thinking is, too, is you can't just, listen to it and just say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, you can't just listen to something one time and tell whether anything is good or not because if, if something really strikes you like and you think you catch it all in the first listen, you